The Justice League is vaporized in a single blast, and Mr. Fantastic ends up a pile of blue spaghetti. It's been a rough year for superheroes. Here's who's dead. Like his sons Thor and Loki, Odin appears in Marvel comics and movies, DC comics, various works of fantasy, and of course, North mythology. MCU viewers associate the Allfather with Anthony Hopkins' portrayal in the first three Thor movies. As is the case with Asgard itself, Marvel's Odin goes through cycles of destruction and rebirth. He dematerializes into particles of bright light at the beginning of Thor Ragnarok and similarly wills himself out of existence at the conclusion of 2022's Thor No. 22 by writer Donny Cates and artist Nick Klein. I'm on a different path now. This you must face alone. In this penultimate installment of Cates' God of Hammers arc, Odin reveals that his continued existence is preventing Thor, the current King of Asgard, from wielding the full cosmic might usually at the disposal of his royal station. Recognizing that Thor needs an extra boost to defeat the renegade God of Hammers, a blend of Mjolnir's energy and the nefarious Mangog, Odin releases the last of his power to his son, erasing himself in the process. In 2016 Suicide Squad, only two members of Task Force X bite the big one. In contrast, 2021's The Suicide Squad includes a wholesale massacre of DC C-list baddies. Fortunately, this slaughter does not include Peacemaker, allowing him to return for his HBO Max series. Perhaps in the interest of consistency with the film, Peacemaker ends season one with fewer characters than it starts. Most of these characters are ordinary humans or members of the hostile alien race colloquially known as Butterflies. The butterfly Eknob Loke, who inhabits the body of ex-mercenary Clemson Mern, is sort of both. And in many respects, his ultimately self-sacrificing quest to prevent his fellow butterflies from annihilating the human race qualifies as superheroic. After the butterflies take over the police force of Evergreen Washington, Mern throws himself under the metaphorical bus to allow Harcourt and Adebayo to evade execution and carry on with their mission. In a tragic twist, the butterfly Eek Stack Eek Eek, sometimes referred to as Goth, and inhabiting the body of the detective Sophie Song, happens to be the individual who repeatedly pulls the trigger on Mern. We haven't seen a ton of super pets since 1985's Crisis on Infinite Earths reset the DC Universe's timeline and removed them from officially recognized existence. So it's nice to see Crypto the Super Dog and Comet the Super Horse make something of a comeback in 2021's Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow. The eight-issue epic sends Kara Zor-El on a galaxy-spanning journey. She's determined to track down Krem, an interstellar pirate who needlessly slew her friend's father, then poisoned Crypto while making his escape. By the time the final issue arrives, Supergirl has successfully detained Krem. However, Krem manages to send for a cavalry of space pirates to help reverse his fortune. After a significant struggle, Supergirl manages to dispatch these baddies, but Comet loses his life in the process. It's a little ambiguous whether Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow is a canonical tale, so this comet's precise nature is difficult to pin down. But Supergirl does mention that she knew he was a man cursed to live as a horse, a fact he didn't love talking about. This death might not stick, but it's still enormously moving. Netflix threw its hat into the superhero satire ring with 2022's The Guardians of Justice. Reminiscent of The Boys, Invincible, and HBO's Watchmen, The Guardians of Justice doesn't treat the cape and cowl set as spotless heroes. Marvelous Man, this universe's Superman equivalent, seemingly dies live on television, but some of his colleagues suspect foul play. Time. Time found my escape. No, don't do this, Cal. Much like Rorschach's search for the comedian's killer kicks off Watchmen, the Guardians of Justice joins Nighthawk as he explores the mystery of Marvelous Man's death. But who is Marvelous Man? He arrived on Earth after his home planet was destroyed by a brainiac-like villain. Like any wannabe Superman worth his salt, Marvelous Man can fly, has heat vision, boasts seemingly impossible strength, and is virtually invulnerable to all potential harm, except for this world's kryptonite equivalent. The copyright-safe version of a kryptonite bullet that kills him is ostensibly stolen from a stand-in for Lex Luthor. Sound bizarre? It is. But that's the Guardians of Justice in a copyright-safe kryptonite-laced nutshell.
In 2022's The Human Target, private investigator Christopher Chance, aka The Human Target, ingests a slow-acting poison intended for Lex Luthor. He has 12 days to figure out who's to blame for his rapidly approaching death, and the hard-boiled gumshoe suspects the involvement of at least one member of Justice League International. The ensuing tale blends elements of noir detective traditions and the irreverent side of DC publishing that emerged in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Whether or not Tom King and Greg Smallwood's miniseries takes place in the mainstream DC timeline is unclear. Therefore, Guy Gardner may appear in another, more canonical story before the end of the year, or even re-emerge somehow in The Human Target. Nevertheless, the fact remains that the Green Lantern Corps' biggest jerk is killed in a fight with Ice, his ex, and Chris Chance in The Human Target No. 6. Originally one of Christopher's suspects, Sub-Zero superheroine Ice eventually becomes his romantic interest, much to Guy's jealous fury. The third most famous Green Lantern attacks the new couple after a night of passion, only to find himself frozen solid and shattered to pieces in that order. Let that be a lesson to awful exes everywhere. Nothing good ever comes from stalking and harassment, even if you have a power ring from space. Plenty of folks who'd like to get into superhero comics find themselves stymied by DC and Marvel's convoluted continuity, jarring reboots, and reliance upon obscure characters with omnipotent powers appearing from out of nowhere. They've got a new hurdle to clear, courtesy of Justice League No. 75 by Joshua Williamson and Rafa Sandoval. In this issue, a previously benevolent dimensional traveler named Pariah effortlessly dematerializes a sizable fraction of DC's best known, usually unstoppable champions of virtue. Specifically, Pariah kills the Justice League. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, Zatanna, Aquaman, Hawkgirl, and the Martian Manhunter all evaporate into nothing. He also bumps off multidimensional Justice Leaguers, including President Superman of Earth-23, Dr. Multiverse of Earth-8, Captain Carrot of Earth-23, and a handful of others. Promotional materials tell us this ghastly, traumatizing massacre of globally beloved characters leads into DC's Summer of 2022 event, Dark Crisis. All of this is plenty shocking by itself, but here's the kicker! Current Action Comics scribe Philip Kennedy Johnson has already made it known, via an interview with CBR, that Superman's death will in no way interrupt Kal-El's noble struggle against intergalactic tyranny and oppression in his concurrent War World saga. Likewise, ceasing to exist doesn't seem to be stopping Batman from hunting Ra's al Ghul's assassin in the Shadow War multi-series crossover. DC's most prominent heroes have died in Justice League. Somehow, they all continue to prosper in their solo adventures. What gives? We suppose we'll have to keep reading. Fans of the Fantastic Four have waited years for Marvel's first family to take their rightful place at the center of the MCU, and they probably won't have to stay patient for much longer. Even though it's currently in need of a new director, Marvel's Fantastic Four should come to fruition within the not-so-distant future. Hopefully the version of Reed Richards from the mainstream MCU timeline fares a little better than the Reed who leads the Illuminati from Earth-838 because that guy dies a swift and humiliating death. In Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, the Scarlet Witch chases Stephen Strange and America Chavez to Earth-838, hoping to use America's dimension-hopping powers to reunite with her sons. Earth-838's Illuminati, a secretive group of elite superheroes, do not initially take the threat of the Scarlet Witch seriously. If they can beat Thanos, how much of a problem could Wanda Maximoff possibly be? Right? As it happens, the Scarlet Witch controls reality itself, so she turns Reed into string cheese and then makes his brains explode. The Inhumans TV show is the biggest abject failure in MCU history, and there isn't a close second. The X-Men's movie rights returning to Marvel pretty much destroys any remaining chance of the Inhumans occupying the MCU's lane for genetically gifted outcasts. And Black Bolt probably died the most gruesome and unsettling demise of any Illuminati member in Multiverse of Madness, which is saying something. After Reed Richards of Earth-838 informs Wanda that Black Bolt can annihilate her with a whisper, Wanda simply smirks and uses her magic. What mouth? The King of the Inhumans then notices that his mouth has vanished. 
He panics, and the resulting yelp causes his skull to pop like a blister. We don't think the mainstream MCU timeline's Black Bolt, also played by Anson Mount, would ever be dumb enough to use his unfathomably destructive vocal cords while his mouth was sewn shut. He might be a commercial failure, but the Black Bolt of the ABC television network is probably way harder to kill than this guy. Since arriving on the scene in 2011's Captain America The First Avenger, Peggy Carter has journeyed from movies to network television to streaming animation. While anyone who watched ABC's Agent Carter can attest to the combat prowess of the version of Peggy who resides in the regular MCU timeline, the Peggy variant from What If Captain Carter Were the First Avenger would probably be more useful in a fight against Doctor Doom. The Disney Plus series What If tells us the tale of Captain Carter, a time-displaced World War II-era hero who's injected with the Super Soldier Serum when the original test subject, Steve Rogers, is made temporarily unavailable. However, we can safely presume the events of What If are not directly connected to conditions on Earth-838. Captain Carter is slated for significant amounts of screen time in What If Season 2, and the Earth-838 variant of Peggy is all out of time, screen-related or otherwise. Relative to the other Illuminati members, Captain Carter puts up a decent fight against the Scarlet Witch. She even manages to land a few strikes before Wanda takes telepathic control of Captain Carter's signature shield and uses it to separate Peggy's lower half from the rest of her torso. In the primary MCU timeline, Maria Rambeau is Carol Danvers' friend and the mother of Monica Rambeau. She sadly passes away during the years between Infinity War and Endgame, but not before making a big impact in the world of the MCU by founding S.W.O.R.D. In Earth-838, Maria became Captain Marvel instead of Carol Danvers, and she went on to join Reed Richards' Illuminati. Sharing the attitude of the rest of her pompous secret society, Maria tells Strange they can handle your little witch if Wanda Maximoff shows up looking for America Chavez. As it turns out, Earth-838's Captain Marvel can't handle the little witch Witch, who squashes Captain Marvel by dropping a statue on her. Somewhat curiously, Earth-838 Maria wears a teal-colored costume similar to the uniform Carol Danvers fights in during her time as the amnesiac Kree warrior Vers in 2019's Captain Marvel. In theory, this could indicate that some sort of diplomatic relationship exists between the Kree and the governments of Earth-838, but who knows if we'll ever hear more about this timeline's history. Patrick Stewart played Professor Charles Xavier for the first time back in the year 2000's X-Men and once said he'd step away from the role after the high note of 2017's Logan. Apparently, Kevin Feige used mind control abilities of his own to convince Stewart to play Xavier for the eighth time in Multiverse of Madness. Although, in fairness, since the Earth-838 variant of the benevolent mutant telepath technically isn't the same person we see leading the X-Men in any 20th Century Studios X-Men movies, Stewart could somewhat credibly argue that he never went back on his word. Like the rest of the Illuminati, Earth-838 Professor X finds himself utterly overwhelmed by the Scarlet Witch, who creeps up behind him while he's inside Wanda's mind and snaps his neck like a celery stick. We wish we could have seen more of Professor X in the Multiverse of Madness, especially after Stewart's authoritative declaration of, we should tell him the truth, was so heavily featured in trailers. Unpredictable explosions of grotesque violence are a huge part of the appeal of Amazon Prime's The Boys. Based on the remains that Homelander shows to Starlight in glorious five-year plan, it's hard to tell exactly what the leader of the Seven did to Supersonic. It looks like Homelander punched his face into his skull and cut his leg off with his heat vision, but we can only speculate on the precise nature of Supersonic's multiple fatal injuries. Years before winning the American Hero reality show competition and joining the Seven, Supersonic had been Starlight's first boyfriend, and nothing we see on the boys indicates that he was anything short of a perfect gentleman. In fact, his friendship with Starlight and his principled inclination towards doing the right thing is exactly what ultimately lands him in Homelander's crosshairs. Stop it! You know how that ends. Little is known of the winged soup known as Swato, other than he was a member of Payback and a close associate of Soldier Boy during the 1980s. While his demise was needless and tragic, it provides a teachable moment for the rest of us. It's important to remember certain abilities are less useful than others in specific situations. In this instance, while the power of hovering flight is handy for rescuing cats from trees, 
It's utterly worthless against enemies wielding anti-air artillery. We Know Payback's 1984 mission in Nicaragua is primarily notable for the disappearance of Soldier Boy and subsequent government cover-up. However, the fiasco also marks the final moments of Swato. The Green Lantern of Sector 2813 made his first comic book appearance in the early 1960s and has remained a consistent supporting cast member in comics, animated series, and video games. Tomare is a fairly significant relative to the hundreds of other DC characters who've been created over the years. And talking about him as if he might as well be a red shirt from Star Trek the original series is a little preposterous. Nevertheless, it happens to be the case that the Young Justice version of Tomare is killed battling Lorzod on New Genesis in the Season 4 episode Odyssey of Death. While he's introduced a few episodes earlier, he doesn't get a ton of time in the spotlight before the curtains fall. That said, he makes the most of the few moments he does have on screen. Tomare explains that his failure to prevent the destruction of Krypton has haunted him for decades. See, he knew and admired Superman's biological father, Jor-El. While Tomare himself doesn't survive Lorzod's assault, he does manage to save New Genesis from sharing Krypton's fate and wraps up his tenure in the universe with a little bit of redemption. One of the ex-Payback members who betrays Soldier Boy, Crimson Countess might be one of the most bearable affiliates of the original Vought Super Team. Naturally, there's some degree of narcissism and a savior complex motivating her advocacy for endangered chimpanzees, but at least she channels her personality shortcomings in a positive direction. Though the fact that these days she calls a small trailer her home, perhaps her one true weakness is sound financial investing. Speaking of her trailer, that's where she's blasted off the face of existence by an exploding soldier boy, a fate shared by numerous characters in the third season of Amazon's pitch black superhero satire. Maybe it's a little cold to turn your boyfriend over to hostile military scientists, but at the end of the day, wasn't helping put soldier boy out of commission the right thing to do? We don't spend a ton of time with Blue Hawk on the boys. He's only in a few episodes and mostly exists to serve as a ruthless commentary on how American police have handled the deaths of George Floyd and numerous others. I, I go where the crime is, and the crime just happens to be in, in black neighborhoods. That, that's Blue Hawk swears he's not racist, but he also insists that hip hop doesn't count as real music. He went all the way down the birtherism rabbit hole during the Obama administration and frequently bemoans the perceived unfairness of his inability to say racial slurs in public without social consequences. A-Train has made some unfortunate choices over the years, but breaking the sound barrier while dragging Blue Hawk across the pavement probably isn't on his list of regrets. The TNT twins were former members of Payback who, when they held hands, could shoot lightning like bursts at baddies, but that's definitely not what we remember them for. More memorably, the TNT twins are the hosts of Herogasm in The Boys Season 3. As we see from a flashback to the 1980s, they were essentially useless in serious combat situations. Back in their heyday, the TNT twins shot a little laser that made a big noise and could knock people over, meaning virtually any ranged weapon would have been more effective than their so-called superpowers. As a result, they functioned a little more like television personalities than what we typically think of as superheroes. By the time Soldier Boy catches up to them at Herogasm, their powers no longer work at all due to years of neglect. By the end of their lives, Tommy and Tessa are more like aging circus performers than one-time crime fighters. So even if you don't approve of their lifestyle choices, one has to wonder if they really deserve to be victims of Soldier Boy's homicidal rampage. In the latest Thor movie, Jane Foster is dying of cancer while she devotes her dwindling existence to defending innocent people from all manner of cosmic threats. I just want to say that was very, very impressive what you did back there. However, Thor Love and Thunder is only partly Jane's movie, for pretty understandable reasons. Chris Hemsworth is still very much the star of the show. In the continuity of the MCU, Jane spent several years away from the spotlight, but the latest film in the franchise sees her triumphant return, this time as more than a basic love interest. Sometime after her experiences in 2011's Thor and 2013's Thor The Dark World, Jane Foster breaks up with intergalactically acknowledged hunk Thor. Following a diagnosis of late-stage cancer, Jane finds herself drawn to the Asgardian hammer Mjolnir, which declares her worthy and transforms her into the mighty Thor. 
Tragically, the magic hammer is unable to cure her illness. In fact, using the weapon is actually hurting her. But she chooses to pick up Mjolnir and save her Asgardian boyfriend right as he's about to meet his fate. As a result of her selfless decision, she dies shortly after the final confrontation with Gore the God Butcher and is welcomed into Valhalla. While we lost numerous heroes, a few villains also didn't survive 2022. With so many supervillains hatching so many devious plots at all times, you'd think there'd be no original scheme for world domination left untried. Orm, the Ocean Master from Young Justice, is basically Loki with far less charisma, but let's give him credit. He attempts what truly seems to be an original evil plan. Correctly guessing he could charm the people of Atlantis by embodying an imagined glorious past, Ocean Master transplants his consciousness into a clone of Arion, the original leader of the Undersea Kingdom. Ocean Master wins major battles and makes plenty of inspiring speeches. To cover his bases, he also clones himself and loads that clone up with memories so only an expert mind reader could sniff out his ruse. This is your chance to redeem yourself before the light and achieve everything I have ever dreamt of. As it happens, the Young Justice crew includes prominent telepath McGann Mraz, who easily figures out what's up. But by the time McGann warns the Atlanteans of Ocean Master's presence in Arion's body at the end of Season 4's Leviathan Wakes, it's too late. Arion is declared the new king of Atlantis. Luckily, thanks to an ancient prophecy involving the Lords of Order and Vandal Savage, Arion spectacularly explodes the instant he puts the crown on his head. Longtime arch nemesis to Bruce Wayne and scary grandpa to Damian Wayne, Ra's al Ghul is assassinated at the onset of DC's Shadow War event, causing plenty of readers to roll their eyes. Not only does Ra's, the centuries old, one time leader of the League of Assassins, benefit from the same squishy relationship with mortality that keeps the rest of DC and Marvel's denizens uniquely prone to resurrections, immortality is kind of his whole deal. In the past, when injuries or illness had Roz skirting the edges of the Great Beyond, he'd retreat to the Lazarus Pit, a literal fountain of youth, and regenerate his body into that of a younger, healthier, megalomaniacal eco-terrorist. Basically, Roz al Ghul dying and not coming back is kind of like if the Joker stopped doing murders and laughing at ironically morbid circumstances. It just feels wrong, even if it's clearly a positive development for the citizens of Gotham City. But implausible as it seems, after Shadow War, a multi-title crossover penned by Joshua Williamson, Ra's al Ghul remains as apparently deceased as he does at the beginning. Damien is still pretty messed up about the death of Alfred Pennyworth, and now he's lost his literal grandfather shortly after his surrogate grandfather. When the mercenary forces of Talia al Ghul and Deathstroke throw down in Shadow War, a lot of them die, including Respawn. The promising young killing machine debuts in the League of Lazarus deathmatch tournament seen in the pages of 2021's Robin. He initially appears to have lifted his costume style and gimmick from Deathstroke. But Respawn is much more than a Slade Wilson fanboy. Ra's al Ghul, being an utterly insane scientific genius, mixed genetic material from his daughter Talia and Deathstroke to create the mercenary. Damian Wayne is initially psyched to find out he has a half-brother, but his excitement is short-lived. Shortly after the two meet, Respawn hurls himself in front of a hail of bullets and various other projectile weapons intended for Slade, and as a result, he is ripped to shreds. Over the years, Young Justice has done a spectacular job establishing its unique vision of the Teen Titans, but its takes on the DC Universe's big bad guys tend to feel a little traditional. The Light is a pretty faithful version of the Legion of Doom. Villains linked with Markovia and Apocalypse routinely appear in other DC animated projects, and the General Zod of Young Justice Phantoms, to his credit, is not a major departure from Terrence Stamp's Zod of Yore. Come to me, son of Jarrell! Kneel before Zod! But that brings us to Lorzod, Elder Zod's savvy and cold-blooded son, a profoundly dangerous foil for Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. Lorzod feels like a deranged sociopath who is specific to Young Justice. However, Season 4 ends with Lorzod teleporting into a bomb blast on Mars that vaporizes him immediately. But that doesn't mean we'll never see him again. He is a time traveler, after all. Even if Lorzod is permanently toast, 
The final moments of Phantoms lead us to believe a hypothetical next season will definitely not share the uninteresting villain problems of previous seasons.